Hello, everyone, and welcome to the RP Spotlight. I'm Bootsy, uh, Minister of Media, and I'm here with Am, uh, who is going to be speaking about his two nations. Um, how are you doing tonight, Am? I am fantastic, Bootsy. It's a little weird to be on the other side of this, for sure. I was going to say, that's, <laughs> that's probably a little interesting for you to not be actually hosting one of these. Um, yeah, it's, it's really strange. So tell me, uh, what what brought you to RP? You know, what what's kind of your history with um, kind of the out of character element of um, RP? So, kind of like with the out of character element, uh, I just kind of saw guys doing role play for uh, the RMB set Strange Real, probably about no, three four years ago now and i thought hey that looks kind of neat so i applied with their map there and had uh had a fairly long run with them actually about about two years and then uh moved over to to eris and like with with the rp community here it's they're they're some of the most creative and fantastic people and that's just like something that i felt like i needed in my life, like not only to have a creative outlet, but be around people that understand that. So, you know, back back in the day, I was a um, role player. I did um, mostly Eris um, RP, RP, and then I um, did um, the space one. I always I want to pronounce it wrong, so I'm not going to say it's Aeneas, Aeneas, Aeneas. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah, yes. I did that for a little bit, but no, I never did um, Strange Real because um, the concept of R&B RP um, never really vibed with me, but I knew that it was, you know, quite different from Eris RP. What made you jump over from um, doing R- R&B RP to doing um, Forum Side RP? So that was kind of a... Uh... I kind of became disenchanted with the Strange Real setting. Like, it just didn't have the the realism and the kind of aesthetic that I wanted to go for. Uh, that's not that's not to talk down on Strange Real at all. I think it's a it's a fantastic setting with a lot of fantastic RPers. But it just didn't offer me the outlet that I saw that I needed anymore, and I wanted to write more. I want to say mature works, which uh, on the forum, the the guidelines for what you are allowed to have in your writing are a little less strict because it's not governed by uh, nation states, you know, terms of conduct, policy, stuff like that. And, you know, reading, reading a lot of the era stuff was just fascinating for me because you have guys like Prydania with his For the King to Valhalla post which is, I believe, one of the longest-running posts on the forum right now, and it is fantastic. If like, if you want to do some reading, go do that. There's uh, Andy uh, Andren, and he makes amazing stuff, especially in his work with uh, Thorka, which is his, <clears throat> which is his uh, religion he's created. Um, Goyanis is incredible with the way he can build infrastructure and everything and so looking at these guys it was like wow like these are people that have put a lot of effort and thought into what they want to do and i wanted to be part of that and so i made a claim with uh yam and tau and um yeah like i've I've just been in the same spot ever since writing stories and it's i've loved it so you stated earlier that you have two RP nations. Are they both in Eros now, or is one still in yes, Strange? Yes, they are. Okay, I didn't know. Um, yeah. Okay, just wanted to make uh, sure. I have not RP in Strange Real. I have not RP in Strange for coming up on two years now. Um, so my secondary nation is on the continent of Aurora, and it's called Afira. And so Afira is a passion project of mine that I've somewhat carried over from Strange Real using a fictitious race of, uh, I'm not sure how to explain this. They are basically very large mutated people. 
And uh, yeah, so they have a fairly long history with the Imperium, which is their neighbor, of uh, some pretty horrific cruelty on behalf of the Imperium. And so, you know, they got chased into the mountains and they ended up becoming uh, these people called the Aferans. And, you know, the average Aferan is about seven feet tall and has either a green, gray, or blue and black marble to their skin tone. They are basically uh, orcs modeled after Tolkien's orcs. They're, uh, yeah, they've been a passion project of mine for a long time. They started out as the saw teeth on, uh, on the RMB. That's, that's actually really interesting. I haven't met many people over the course of my, um, role, role play experiences who have done, um, different races and stuff. Um, now you said a lot of it came from Tolkien. Do you have any, um, other inspirations or is it just Tolkien where you yeah. got here? With, with- so with Afira, uh, as most people who know me will very well know, I'm a major, major fan of uh, classic horror literature, especially uh, H.P. Lovecraft. And so a lot of the inspiration for Afira, and especially like its mythology, its creatures, its people, come from H.P. Uh, Lovecraft stories like the Dunwich Horror, uh, Dagon, the Shadow over Innsmouth, uh, a lot of stuff like that, because uh, at their core, they are a very, like, esoteric occult people with with a really deep, like, strangeness to them. Yeah, if they were seven feet tall and had marble skin, I definitely think they would have some uh, strangeness to them. Um, but, you know, how how does that work in terms of, you know, the outside um, world? Do they stick to themselves since they're, you know, so much different? So with with that, they, they were, like, when they were, like, properly human— uh, they were fairly well known to rove all around Aurora as, you know, fishermen and merchants. And when the Imperium uh, began to kind of, you know, take out this really awful kind of aggression on them, they moved into the Aphiris Mountains and began, like, sticking more to themselves because they didn't really tell the difference between Imperials and, you know, men from other places. And so they all just saw them as the same until probably the late 1800s where they came and met a party of men on the shore who used them to firearms. And from that point on, they were able to kind of combat the Imperium a little better. And they started to open up a little more until about 1970 where the second Ephirian genocide happened, uh, perpetrated by the Imperium. And it was actually uh, Ray Vostoka, uh, Yap's secondary nation, Aurora, that facilitated a mass exodus of Afirans to Matera by way of Yamantau, my primary nation. And so since then, they've kind of just spread it all over. Like, it's up to individual RPers if they want to say, like, yeah, sure, we had Afirian refugees or not. Like, some people don't even recognize them. They just believe they're very strange-looking humans. Like, they don't uh, formally recognize them as the species that was uh, proposed to and passed by the Eris RP Conclave. And so with that, it's kind of... I can't push anyone to accept anything about the Aferans. All I can do is kind of say that, like, they are a social people... And they do like to travel, but it's it's really it's really kind of restricted by whether people choose to recognize them or not. Yeah, I remember back when um, I was in uh, role play, we had like dragons and other um, fantasy elements. So it's definitely uh, a challenge, like you said, to get everybody to be on the same board. And obviously, it's within that role player's rights to say, "Hey, you know, we don't want them." here because it doesn't make sense in our story 
Um, but it's good that um, there are a lot of uh, role players that are getting on board and, and really help build that story. So tell me about your other nation. Yeah, Yamantel is a uh, it's a very Slavic based nation. It's based around uh, the Soviet era countries. Like it's kind of a mishmash of everything of like Poland, Russia, uh, uh, Serbia, Croatia, stuff like that. Um, honestly, it's kind of embarrassing to admit, but the inspiration for both the name and the nation itself came to me while playing Metro Exodus for about the third or fourth time through. Is that a is that a name within the the game? Uh, Yamantau is, actually is actually the name of a mountain in Russia. Um, I somehow managed to get around the you're not allowed to name your nation. I believe it was uh, Sil Dorset has said that if he had caught it in time, it wouldn't have flown, but it was too late by the time that it was already added to the map. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's okay. That's really cool that um, you were able to skirt around the rules. Um, I mean, obviously, that's not something. <laughs> it's not, it's, <laughs> don't, don't circumvent the rules, kids. Don't circumvent moderation. Okay, sorry, I haven't played Met Met okay. Metro Exodus, okay. so that's why I was like, uh, is that important to the plot? Or Okay, that makes sense, it's a mountain. Um, so, sorry, were you about to say something? Nope. Okay, um, you know, uh, what, what parts of, um, you know, that game or that story really um, inspired you to make uh, Yamantau? So with that, uh, it wasn't, it was actually one specific section of Exodus that kind of inspired me to envision uh, a larger nation, and that was the Taiga River section of, of the game. And it was just like the, the kind of natural beauty of that whole area. And I, you know, I did some research myself and like the actual Taiga Valley and stuff like that. And it looked just gorgeous. And then I started looking into all of these other, you know, cities in Russia, which turned to Kazakhstan, which turned to, you know, Croatia, Poland, Serbia, stuff like that, and all these really beautiful places. And I thought, what if I kind of pushed all of the cultural and natural influences into one spot and, you know, made it a nation? And for me, that just kind of worked. Like it wasn't hard to to imagine how you know all of these different little pieces could intertwine and mingle with one another, and yeah, like it just it just worked for me. So you definitely have some really cool nations um, that you've built. What kind of RPs have you done um, involving these nations? So with Yamantau, uh, currently it's in probably the longest goddamn war ever with uh, the Imperium over a series of misunderstandings about a war that was written about, you know, just about two years ago, uh, being uh, Andran and Dutrieka. And the Imperium got involved with that conflict, and Yamantau called them out for it, and in turn got themselves into their own conflict. And Steve and I, Steve being the owner of uh, the Imperium, we are pretty pretty close friends uh, outside of RP. We refer to each other as our hetero life partners. But um, we have really kind of fallen off the track of writing this war. And so that one is in our national roleplay forum under the title of uh, A2 Augustus. I've also written a series of posts kind of stemming back from the original Yamantau post, uh, which is this series called Fields of Yamantau. And so that kind of goes from like a really brief glimpse of what the nation was to what it ended up being uh, as it progressed. And then 
like at the moment I'm kind of writing about life in the more uh, rural and quite frankly occult region of Yamantau, uh known as Saint, uh, Saint of Yan, uh, through a series of posts called The Countess. And The Countess also details life in, uh, in Afira leading up to their peace treaty with the Imperium as to stop the slaughter, like the wholesale slaughter of Afirans on their home soil. And uh, yeah, I'm also working on a few other things for Afira that I'm not quite ready to release yet, but we'll get through in time. Yeah, probably probably want to finish that uh, super long war <laughs> RP post first. So <laughs> waiting on Steve. Waiting on Steve. So it seems like the Imperium is going to be kind of an antagonist for both of your RP nations. Was that intentional, or did it kind of happen to uh, fall that so way? With, it was intentional uh, with Yemen Tau and with Afira, like. I, I don't write Afira for anyone else. I write Afira for me. Like, that is my passion project that, like, I don't care if anyone else enjoys it because it's for me. And with that, you know, Steve kind of approached me and uh, he was looking to set up some history with the Imperium in that area. And, you know, like, he doesn't want to be the, like, the utopian good guy. He wanted to have a little bit of conflict in the background, so I said, sure. And so we've kind of lined it up that the Imperium was the biggest antagonist to the Ephirian people for pretty well the entirety of the Imperium's existence on Aurora. Like, other than a period of about 200 years when they first arrived, where everything was cool, after that it all went terribly, terribly wrong. And so... At, at times, it's it can be a little difficult, like, agree on details, but in the end, he and I always kind of come together and go, okay, yeah, this works, this doesn't, this is cool, this is bad. And, you know, it it works for us. It's by no means a, like, a cooperative nation thing. Like, we both kind of just bounce ideas off of each other, and then agree on details of things that have happened or will happen. And that's cool with us. Yeah, that's that's really awesome to hear that you guys are collaborating and he wasn't afraid to be the, the bad guy because, you know, somebody, somebody's somebody got to be the bad guy in that situation. And it makes that, that story really um, thrive and... Um, you know, makes it more realistic um, because not everything is happy and beautiful in the real world. Uh, that's for sure. Um, so you've written a lot of RPs. Do you have a favorite? Uh, you know, I this is going to sound so corny, but for me, like choosing an art, like a favorite RP is like choosing a favorite child. I don't really have one. Um... There are, like, there's RPs that I'm, I lost you, M, if you're still talking. That is, like, what's there is there, and what's done is done. Like, for me, it's, if I write a post, I can, it'll take maybe two, three days to write it. I'll go through it a couple of times and fix up little things. But once it's on the forum, I have no, I have no interest in going back and editing it other than for, you know, like some grammatical purposes. Because once the energy on that has been expended, it's done. So I'm guessing I can't ask you to choose a favorite nation of yours? Am? <laughs> I'm not sure if you're talking right now, but I cannot hear you. I could not hear you. Hello? 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 Testing. Testing. Hold on one second.
Testing. Testing. Hi, Boozy. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? So the last thing, th- the last thing that I heard from you was, um, you. I asked you about your favorite RP. You said you couldn't choose one, um, but once everything is um, on the forum, it's all good. Did you say anything after that? No, not really. Uh... Yeah, I think it cut off like right as you were about to ask your next question. Yes. So, um, since you said that you couldn't pick a favorite uh, RPM, guessing that asking you a favorite nation would also be as difficult. No, not even. I can tell you right now that my favorite nation that I that's under my control is Afira. Well, damn! Just throw. Uh, Yemintao under the bus. Oh shit! Oh crap! Damn. Listen, okay, well, I, I love what I've out. done. I love what I've done with Yamantau. I love the characters that I've built for it. But Ephira is, and will always be, like my passion project. That it, to get it to happen, I had to take the people to Conclave. Like. If it wasn't that important to me, I would never have bothered with that. So, who would you say that you look up to in the roleplay community? 100% Prydania. 100%. Uh, Pry has been a really important person for me in the community because when I've had... Uh, you know, questions on anything from, you know, how a post sounds to the wording to the grammatical format to, you know, just bouncing ideas off of him. He's always been there. He's always been patient and receptive, no matter how annoying the question is. Like, the guy is, you, you can't beat him. Like, he doesn't miss. It's just, he's he's that guy. Do you have any other influences um, in the RP community besides oh, Prydania? Uh, most likely, yeah. You know, like Zentharida with his writing of Dutriaca, um, Andran, his big one, Goyanus. Like, these are guys who have put a lot of, a lot of thought and a lot of detail in everything they do. And you know what? I'll even, I'll even put uh, Cerixia in there. Cerixia actually helped me get fully established in Eris. When I had no idea what was going on, uh, Seer taught me how to navigate the forum and how to make claims. I believe she also made me my first flag, which was uh, really awesome of him. You know, like, everyone has different opinions of everyone, but for me, like, there was a core of people in this community that really supported me when I first started. And for them, I'm really thankful because... You know, they're really good guys. They are. And that goes for a lot of people in this community. Like, it's full of good people. I will say, um, just in case Cyrexia does listen back in it, um, he has corrected me multiple times about the pronunciation of his name. Apparently it is Cyrexia, so just putting it out there so that he doesn't yell at me if he listens into this. So, (laughs) um, what... uh, What was that? Yeah. Or M? I don't know why I called you Yam. <laughs> I said fair enough. So what alliances are it bleh, what alliances are your nations in? I'm actually not in any alliances. I have made it a conscious and active decision to not join any kind of alliance because for the story purposes of either nation, it doesn't work. Yamantau was an extremely, extremely isolationist nation for about 30 years. So with that, like in 1989, uh, Volodymyr Severton uh, basically cooed and murdered his own father to take over the country and plunged it into this really brutal uh, Stalinist type of uh, communist society where basically the whole thing was shut off. 
Like there was no interaction in or out unless you could find someone who'd be willing to either risk crossing the, the like these lines or risk crossing the uh, what I call the Krajeshk River, which runs between Yamantau and the unclaimed land just ahead of it, uh, just north of it, sorry. And so with that, uh, after the death of Volodymyr Severin at the hands of the current premier, uh, Yegor Zubrov, everything slowly started to open up. But Zubrov kind of kept in mind with this new government that Yamantau needs to prove itself to the world again, that it can stand on its own two feet, that it doesn't need anybody else. And, you know, with that, he's kept friendly relationships with anybody who's kind of approached him. But at the same time, he has no interest in, in uh, joining any kind of alliance or trade organization or anything. It's like a pride thing. And with Ephira, like, at the moment, they're technically tethered to whatever the Imperium wants to do. Except... Uh, with the treaty between the two, the Afirin government, like the Khan especially, is kind of passively pushing against anything that the Imperium wants done politically. Because he signed the treaty to stop the genocide, but after that, he's going to be as much of a pain in the ass as he possibly can. So I'm going to kind of force you to answer the question. If <laughs> if uh, story elements didn't get in the way or pride um, of the nation, what what alliances do you think would be most suited to uh, your two nations? So with that, um, Yamantau would probably most definitely try and join META, which is the uh, Materan Economic Treaty Association. Because it would just mean like better better economic relations with the rest of Matera. And with Afira, um I believe I believe one of its members is in the chat right now, uh, Nevin. It's the Union of Aurorian States, I believe. Yes, the Union of Aurorian States. And so with that, they would probably join into that just because of uh, the fact that the Afirans would want a closer relationship, you know, with uh, Scalvia, which is run by uh, another really fantastic RP uh, named Pradice. And uh, of course, we have uh, Navsland Nevin here. It's, it would just bring the Afirans a sense of security, both economically and in a sense of like actual physical security. Yeah, I was I was kind of hoping you would make uh, uh, the UAS and Meta uh, members that are listening pretty happy to hear that in an alternate universe they may have an additional member. <laughs> um, so, what what is your future um, RPs looking like for your two nations? So, with the future RPs, I have to deal with the fact that uh, Premier Igor Zubrov legitimately just declared himself czar and went off to fight uh, Augustus, the emperor of the Imperium, in an active war zone. So I have to deal with the fallout of that. Uh, I also have to deal with the continuation of the Countess, which is probably, probably where my focus of RP is right now. I It's kind of allowing me to go into that uh, horror horror and occult genre that I really enjoy. And then after that, it's all just kind of up in the air. Like, there's not really a limit on what I can do with the two nations, you know what I mean? Yeah, that that's definitely um, understandable. Now I'm trying to read one of your bare bone questions, um, and there's a typo in it, so I'm going to try to interpret what the heck it means. Um... But I think the question is. Let me let me go. Let me go and look. <laughs> okay, it's number nine. <laughs> number nine. Hey. Uh... 
I think it's trying. If there was one of the other RPs. If there was, it's the question is if there's another RP setting that I would want to try. Which one is it? Um, I'm actually active. Well, not especially active, but active in um, both Ineas and Asheron. Asheron being the post-apocalyptic real-world setting, being captained by uh, Esplandia, who is another really, really, really fantastic member of the community. So <laughs> I'm basically just trying everything that I want to try at the moment. I think the only other one that I would really, that I have any kind of interest in, but I've been kind of too afraid to try it out, is uh, Imperium Galactica, which is also helmed, I believe, by Esplandia. And it's Game of Thrones in space. Woot woot. Gotta, gotta love Game of Thrones and Game of Thrones in space. Uh, I'm definitely, Absolutely. <laughs> definitely seems like a lot of fun. I will say that is tempting me to come back to roleplay, just <laughs> just so everyone's aware. Um let's see. Don't do a boot, Steve. Once you're in, you never get out. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. All too well. Let's see, that is all of the barebone questions that I had. What other things would you like to talk about, Am? Well, here is usually where we'd ask the audience if they have any questions, and they just rattle off usually the exact same questions every single time about you know, the national dish, best athletes, sports, you know, shit like that. So. Oh. Whatever you want to ask, if you have a random question, either you or our listeners, let it fly. Go for it. I don't even care how outlandish it is. Do it. Okay, well, I'm going to ask the one that I asked uh, Wondrous um, last episode. So let's say that there was a threat that was facing both Ephira and uh, Yamatau. And the only way that um, the threat would go away is if the other nation perished. So which country, if either, would take that option in order to save their own country? So here's the thing. The Ephirans in their culture are honor-bound to fight and die for their allies. And through you know, a lot of the things that have happened to the Ephirians that the Yamanta have been there to back them up, the Ephirians would throw themselves under the bus to save Yamantau, while Yamantau would probably just let it happen, because they're kind of scummy. I'm not going to lie to you. Okay, audience, while you um, put your questions in the chat box, I'm going to ask your f the favorite uh, dish, uh, or the national dish of um, the two nations. So with Afira, um, their capital city is actually named after their national fish, which is Pua Pua. And Pua Pua is a large, flat, white fish that is usually served with um, water chestnuts and rice. It's a very, it's a very Asian-looking dish uh, for a very uh, Maori based culture. And with Yamantau, I don't know. Yamantau doesn't really have a national dish. Most of their national identity was wiped out by the uh, Subvertin administration. And so what they kind of have now is a street food called uh, Chibura Ki, which is it looks like a pizza pop stuffed with meat. I couldn't tell you what meat because it changes all the time. It's just a random ground meat in a dough pocket. It's usually served with uh, mayonnaise or a spicy sauce. Man, that sounds good. <laughs> Not going to lie. We've got it some questions. Is. I myself make them. I myself make them personally in my own kitchen, and they are fantastic. Uh, while we're waiting on the audience questions, what is the weirdest thing you've had to um, write for your role plays? Uh, okay, the weirdest thing that I've ever had to write was actually a few of the death scenes in Fields of Yam and Tao. Because you have to kind of tread this fine line between realism and romanticism when it comes to writing your character deaths. Because in reality, you know, 
like with the death of uh Grigori, who was the uh the commandant under Zubrov for a few months uh during the beginning of the regime, uh Grigori was shot and killed by Zubrov and his and uh, Grigori's wife in their apartment using an assault rifle. And it having to write that scene, I rewrote it probably about three or four different times because I had to step back from what detail would be too much and you have to kind of romanticize the death a little bit to feed into the actual story instead of it just making it this absolute shock post. You know what I mean? And for Afira, I, I really... I really have to tread the line, especially there with realism and romanticism, because it's basically just uh, like a high fantasy nation without wizards and elves and shit. And so it's, for me, it's really, it's just really weird to have to dial everything back and really like look at everything. That might not be strange to other people, but it's really, really, really weird to me. Well, no, I definitely understand. Um, it's definitely, you know, an interesting setup to have, you know, such a fantasy element and try to, you know, m- oh, adapt did it. Oh, we lose Bootsy again? Oh my gosh, can you hear me? You can't hear me. <sighs> really? Okay, hold on one second. Okay, uh, this is where you cut again, (laughs) if you're curious. kind of czar though like he has no actual constitutional power he's more of like a behind the scenes i still run everything but you're gonna think that the premier runs things kind of guy though okay i am back i don't know what my computer keeps doing um so where were we (laughs) you just finished asking what the weirdest part of rp like writing an rp was for me i think okay so, yes, that's definitely, um, you know, that can be quite weird because you're trying to adapt um, something that's usually found in, like, fantasy novels and trying to make it, you know, more realistic. So it's definitely an interesting, um, I wouldn't call it weird, but definitely interesting uh, thing to try to do. So we've got a question from Sargasso, Sargat. Sargasso? Am I saying his name right? Okay. (laughs) Um, 
It's whatevs. Okay, cool. Um, what is the music in Yamantau like? It's, you know, I would I would honestly say it's a little mix of everything. Like, there's the traditional kind of stuff. Uh, of course, being a very Russian-inspired nation, there's, of course, going to be hard bass. Um, I think at one point I had written a post about the uh, underground hip-hop uh, metal and punk scene in Yamantau and about how it was such a major thing because they were so repressed for so long. And yeah, there's it's it's like a mix of everything that you could probably really think of. There is no Yamanta country music singers. I will put that out there. Does Ephira have... I, this wasn't originally part of the question, but does Ephira, Ephira have any um, music that's popular there? Absolutely it does. Well, Afira has um this is this is kind of an insert that I probably shouldn't put in there, but I, I did because uh I personally love this band. I've just kind of changed their name. Uh so the band is Alien Weaponry and it's that is the actual name of the band in real life. They are from New Zealand. They do uh thrash metal with uh, the Maori language. And with the fear of being a really heavily Maori-inspired nation and Polynesian-inspired nation, I, of course, had to insert that band in there. So they're like, uh, I don't have the post up, so I couldn't tell you exactly what I called them, but I think it was called Space Technology. <laughs> and it was... It's literally just an insert of this band, and they're, like, the top-selling band there. Like, Afirans are an incredibly aggressive warlike people like and it like at the heart of their culture and so heavy metal and punk music is massive in afira so um we've got a question from nevin i believe hold on yes it is um would it ever be possible for Afira to be free of Imperium's influence and allowed to become a completely independent nation. Well, you see, dear sweet Nevin, that is something we are working on right now. Uh, Steve and I are kind of chatting privately about uh, something to do with that. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll have more details for you when that comes out. Nevin said, ooh, he can't wait. I mean, he probably didn't say it like that, but, you know, whatever. Uh, oh, that's he... probably exactly how he said it. <laughs> um, he also asked, uh, what is the government of Afira like? So the government of Afira is kind of strange. At its head, there is the Afiran Khan, who, once he reaches... Uh, a certain age, like a fear in people because of the genetic mutations and because of the effects that the radiological interference have in their health, they don't live much longer than about 50. Like, and that's like ancient for an Afirin. And so once the con kind of hits about 45, 50, he declares a tournament. And so it brings together all the strongest warriors from across the So all of the tribes get together. They send their five strongest warriors to compete in an almost gladiator type scenario. And so the last man standing fights the Khan. If he can kill the Khan, he gets to take over as Khan. But if the Khan beats him, the Khan gets to choose his successor. So with that, the Khan then chooses among all of the tribe's people a new chieftain for each tribe. So that chieftain represents the people of that tribe and reports directly back to him. And below the chieftain, there's like his advisors and whatnot for each tribe. Now, the Khan has zero interest in intertribal conflict. If one tribe goes and kills off the entire other tribe and takes their territory so that they can have more of a say or more of a chance of one of their tribes in becoming Khan, the Khan doesn't even care. Conflict is, at its root, encouraged and worshipped in Afira. 
like everything, religion, government, everything revolves around warfare and conflict. So this may be another weird question, um, but uh, if there was any um, real life or someone from, um, you know, a film or TV or video game, um, who who would you say would really, really enjoy either Fira or uh, Yemintel? <laughs> I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. If I'm being honest with you, um, <laughs> this is going to sound kind of strange, but if anyone is familiar with the current iteration of the Doom Marine from the video game series Doom, I'm sure he would fit in incredibly well in a fear and culture. And if we're talking about uh, Yam and Tao, I'm not really sure. I don't. I can't think of any kind of tv movie or video game character that would ever want to live in in yam and tau no no celebrities either that you could think of i really highly doubt it if you're fishing for vladimir putin i think you'd be sorely sorely wrong because yam and tau has a horrible history of uh one man killing the other to take his place uh, all the way back to its founding which you know it kind of stopped during the unification period uh, under um, Zerna the Great, but other than that, like it's it's not a place where men in positions of power tend to last long, either by you know public push or you know assassination by their would be successor. Like it just it's not a great place to be a politician. So, Vapia asks, how has the war with Imperium um, impacted Yamatel's international relations? You know, it hasn't gone well for either side because it's just, like, the Imperium really messed up by, first of all, slaughtering innocents in Dutriaca. And then Yamantau really, really did provoke the Imperium into invading. And so when the Imperium invaded, you know, the, the Yamanta are using these horrifying shock and awe tactics against them, including uh, using Afirin shock troopers that had emigrated to Yamantau like years before. And now they're fighting them again on a completely different soil. And they're trying their absolute best to just be as cruel and as harsh as possible to the Imperium to get them to back off. And in response, the Imperium is just escalating. And so it probably doesn't look good from any side to anybody. For the, like with the, with the international relations, I would be highly, highly surprised if Yamantau came out of this without at least some form of con condemnation from the greater public of, of Eris. So in terms of um, military might and power, kind of what, what does that look like from Yemen Tao? Are they on the ground? Is it, you know, airstrikes? It's, it's a little bit of everything. So Yemen Tao, the only thing that Yemen Tao does not maintain is a navy. Because in 1989, when Volodymyr Sverton took over, uh, every ship that was part of the Yemen Navy went into international waters and they scuttled the boats. They refused. They refused to have Zverton be able to strike from the water. And so with that, all that Yamantel really has is a somewhat outdated uh, fighter jet fleet, but they have a massive, massive military, like 500,000 active soldiers at any given one time with 200,000 more in reserve. Like, they're a very militarist place, and they do practice that conscription from the age of 17 until you're 19, you have to serve. The, the ground forces are also a little outdated, shall we say. They're still using weapons that were made in, like, the late, late 80s and early 90s, so they're a little behind everybody else, but they're trying to make do. They 
throw more manpower at a situation than they have firepower. So Sargasso asked, I'm sure you've RP'd a good number of characters, but which ones have you enjoyed writing about? Is it, he says RB. We're, uh, world building, world uh, building. WB is world building and Sorry. RPing the most. <laughs> yes, so thank with, you. With those characters, with those characters, um, so the original two that I had written for Yam and Tal, like the story, Fields of Yam and Tal, really centered around these two men, was... Uh, Alyosha Bulgarin and Grigory Chernenkov. So taking them from uh, simple soldiers to, you know, really splitting them apart and turning them into extremists in either direction, like with Alyosha becoming uh, a terrorist leader by the name of the Shark after he lost his mind, and with Grigory becoming so radicalized. Uh, towards the party as he was a Secret Service agent trying to find organized crime elements in the area that he was working in at the time. So with them, it was a lot of fun to really push them in either direction and then have them come back together with absolutely cataclysmic results. And then after that, probably uh, Igor Zubrov would be you know the number the number three pick. He is uh, a lot of his personality is taken from a Polish rapper named uh, Popek Monster. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Popek, but I based him physically off of this guy, and then I realized that his personality fits what I would like for Zubrov to be. Like he's erratic, he's a drug addict, he is insane. Like he's legitimately insane and he will go to any, any length to achieve his goals. And so as I've taken him and tried to transform him more into, you know, the dude who realizes that he has all these responsibilities. Now he's trying to run a country. He's now trying to raise a daughter as a single father who, you know, his wife was killed in one of the attacks by the black hand terrorist group. Um, he's not a very good father figure. I'll say that if, if you've read some of my posts about, uh, things that he has done in front of his daughter, terrifying. Um, and after that, I think my top two characters that I have, uh, made and world built are Alara and Corollis from the Countess series. Uh, they're a pair of a and, for me, it's easy to write them because they're so they're common people. And so you don't have to take this very formal, like government based approach to them. You just you think of those common people, they talk to each other as common people, they interact with their environment as common people who are now put into an extraordinary circumstance. So it's fun to work with them as common people being put into a situation where they don't know how to deal with it. It's their first time trying to deal with something like this. And you just kind of, it's, it's fun. It's world building. Those characters is like a problem solving exercise. That, that definitely um, is nice to hear that you've got characters that, you know, you really enjoy, um, world building and um you know really uh what's the word i'm looking for i lost my train of thought thank you Am. <laughs> um do we have any other uh audience questions before we start wrapping it up or do you have anything else you'd like to talk about Am? uh i don't really have anything else that i would like to talk about uh i do want to make sure that everybody listening today uh is subscribed to the North Pacific YouTube channel so that you don't miss any of our awesome uploads. Uh, we have a lot of content coming to you in the next in the next few months here as part of this term under glorious Chairman Mad Jack. And yeah, that's about all I got for you right now. I totally thought you were going to stroke my ego and then you totally pulled the rug out from under me when you said Mad Jack. Don't worry. 
we all we all know that it's uh, glorious Chairman Bootsy as well of the Ministry of Propaganda, Ministry of Media. No, please don't unsubscribe. We did have two unsubscribers. I want them back. <laughs> anyway, um, any other questions before we? Oh, okay, thank you, Vapia. Please, please don't unsubscribe. Any other questions before we head out? Speak now or forever. Oh, basically, uh, oh yeah, of course. Now everyone's going to ask their questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we're done. Uh, maybe. Maybe we're done. I don't know. Nevin. I think we're done. I don't know. Nevin, Nevin, Vapia, questions. Ark, questions. No. Ark, you're always full of questions. Oh, Vapia does have a question. Yes, yes, yes Vapia. <laughs> the self-insert character. Oh, boy. Okay, so the question um, is, which one is the self-insert character? I don't know. I have never actually put myself as a character in an RP. Um, yeah, I really don't think I have. That's crazy that you haven't. <laughs> I know I have. So. Oh um. wait, yes, yes, I did. I lied. I lied. There was a uh, foreign intelligence asset uh, named Peter O'Dowd in one of the fields of Yamatau posts that has since been deleted. Um, and he was, you know, basically just like the flannel wearing black ops operator because i had to hype myself up to sound cooler than i was but that was that got that post got deleted uh mostly just because it didn't go with the story there is however a generous insert of uh my late father in fields of yamantel and uh saintly sinners and sinning saints oh that's really cute So what you're saying is you yeah, de you you deleted yourself? Is that <laughs> absolutely? Like, what is the point? What is the point? Well, it looks like that's all of the questions we have for you. Thanks so much, M, for joining us today.